Good morning, ambassadors. It's good to be here today. We bring greetings from First Baptist Church of Santa Maria. And that is, without a doubt, the greatest place on earth to live weather-wise. First of all, how many of you love strawberries? You love strawberries? Man, I love strawberries. We are the strawberry capital of the world. 20% of all strawberries grown on planet Earth come from Santa Maria Valley. And it is unbelievable. Now, when I grew up in Michigan, northern Michigan, we got strawberries two weeks out of the year. In June, there was a two-week season where you could get strawberries. In Santa Maria, California, we get it almost 11 months out of the year that we get strawberries. And the reason is, there's no weather like Santa Maria. Uh, everything on planet Earth can grow in Santa Maria Valley because of its moderate climate. It never gets colder than 45, and it never gets hotter than 85. And every day of the year, it's somewhere in the evenings, it's around mid-50s, and in the day, it's around the mid-70s. And it really is an unbelievable place to live. So we thoroughly enjoy that. We bring greetings from First Baptist Church. The Lord's doing great things out uh, in California. And uh, I had a great talk with Scott on the way back from the airport. And, you know, a lot of times you hear a lot of things about California, and a lot of them are true. I do believe we live in a very socialistic state uh, of all the 50 states uh, of the United States. However, I do believe that the gospel is wide open in California right now. We have seen so many people come to know Christ as their Savior. So many great things are happening. And you know what? Most any time. When something starts in California, it's only a few years later that it's through the rest of the country. Well, I believe that also can be true for revival. And that if revival started in California, that it would spread throughout our country. And we truly believe that. Matter of fact, we're going to talk about a little bit about revival as well. It's so good to see Dr. Comfort again. I can't remember the last time. It has been years uh, since I've seen Dr. Comfort. He saw me right away and he said, wow, your hair is all white now. And I looked at him and I said, yeah, and you haven't grown up yet either, you know. <laughs> All right, take your Bibles and turn to Genesis 45. Genesis 45. Now, Genesis 45 is a great passage for revival because the first time the word revival is mentioned in the entire Bible is found in Genesis 45. Now, Genesis 45 is an interesting passage because... This is a little bit unfortunate in a, in a way as I look at my life. The two Bible characters that probably that I associate with the most is probably Peter and Jacob. And that isn't probably a good thing. But uh, Jacob, uh, I, I mean, this guy's life is amazing. Has there ever been a Bible character that is a better description of the law of the harvest than Jacob? I mean, Jacob reaped what he sowed. He reaped later than he sowed, and he reaped more than he sowed. And that, I mean, Jacob is a classic illustration of this, but yet Jacob has a heart for God, does he not? I mean, there is a burden, there is a passion, and there is a desire that Jacob has for God that is really something amazing. And uh, we see everything coming together in Genesis chapter 45. And uh, I want to share this with you. And I'm about to make one of those huge statements that when you hear in chapel, you need to, you know, you just say, all right, now wait a sec. What's the validity behind that? So, I don't know. That's a pretty big statement. This guy comes in and says that. But I want to tell you, I personally believe that in the Old Testament, you are about to see the most dramatic, emotional moment of the entire Old Testament. The only thing that rivals this in the New Testament, I'll tell you about in a few moments. But I think that this is the most dramatic, emotional moment. Now you say, wow, I mean, you're in some big company there. You got Abraham with a knife over Isaac, his own son. That's pretty dramatic, Brother Shetler. And I'd say, yeah, that is. You got Moses standing at the Red Sea with the Egyptian army coming behind him and pleading with God, God, you got to do something. You got to do it now. That's pretty dramatic. You got Eliyahu, Elijah, up on Mount Carmel praying down, praying down fire and then praying down rain. That's pretty dramatic. 
There are, without any question, some incredibly dramatic moments in the Bible. But I think, emotionally and dramatically, there is nothing like this moment. And you say, well, Brother Shetler, that's a pretty big statement. Let's read the passage, and I want to show you some things about it. Before we do read it, let me ask you this. Have you ever had a day in your life that if you heard any more bad news, you weren't going to make it? In other words, you've heard one, one bad thing after another has happened. I mean, this happened, then this happened, and this happened, and you just wanted to kind of go back in your room, or you just wanted to kind of go back to your house or whatever and just say, I just don't want to hear I don't want to answer the telephone. I don't want to, because I've had one bad thing after another happen. It's like it's getting worse as the day goes. Have you ever had a day like that? I've had a few days like that, all right? But let me ask you this. Have you ever had a day? Have you ever in your entire life had a day? That if you heard one more good thing, you couldn't handle it. That it's just like, okay, wait, wait, stop, stop. Are you going to tell me something good? Yeah, I got something really good. Don't tell me. Don't tell me. I can't handle anything more. I, I, I can't. Have you ever had a day like that? I never. You have, brother? I've never had a day like that. Never in my life have I had a day where, where there's one more good news. You know, I can always handle. When you're pastoring, you can always handle good news. Let me tell you. There's never a day where it's just, like, hey, just if you're going to come in here and tell me some more good news, I don't want to hear it. I just don't want to hear it. But you know what? We have a man here that says, listen, you tell me one more thing, I'm going to die. You tell me one more good thing, I can't handle it. You say, what are you talking that's what happens here with Jacob. I'm telling you, this is an incredible moment. We're going to pick it up in verse 24. You know, a lot of things have happened by the time we get to chapter Genesis 45, verse 24. But I'm figuring we got an ABC college here that knows the basics to this and that you guys know all the things that have happened with Joseph in the pit, in Potiphar's house, in the prison. Now he's raised to be in the palace. He's been able to interpret the dreams of Pharaoh. Uh, the seven bad years of famine have come. He's restored now with his brothers and all of those things. A lot has happened. But now we come to verse 24. The Bible says this. So he, that would be Joseph, sent his brethren away. And they departed by the way, he said this. This is a great verse for a commissioning service for a missionary. And he said unto them, See that ye fall not out by the way. You know what? Joseph knew his brothers pretty good. And he said, Hey, guys, you make sure you get back to dad, okay? Make sure you don't fall out by the way. This is a great message for commencement, too. When you graduate from ABC, you remember, don't fall out along the way. Make sure you finish what God has started. And boy, Joseph gives them a great commissioning there. Verse 25, it says this. And they went up out of Egypt and came into the land of Canaan unto Jacob, their father. Now stop here for just a moment and let's just take just a few moments to think about what we're dealing with at this moment in Jacob's life. There have been two passions in Jacob's life, Jehovah God and Rebecca. I mean, no, no Rachel. <laughs> Not doing good with that. And Rachel. There's two things that have dominated Jacob's life. His God and his love on this earth has been Rachel. And everything in Jacob's life for years has been centered around his love for Rachel. Well, he waited seven years to marry Rachel. And girls, I'm sorry, but I bet you there isn't a guy in here who's going to wait seven years for you. I don't know. But I'm going to tell you this. He waited seven years for Rachel only to get Leah. To wait another seven years, that shows this man's love for this woman. Then Leah started having the kids. And Rachel, oh, she struggled. Finally, after a lot of different things, and we got a few other moms in there that are thrown in there, finally, Rachel has a child. That child we know as Joseph. And oh, the love that, that Jacob had for Rachel is now also entangled with that love and that favoritism towards Joseph. Rachel has one more child, Benjamin, and dies. 
And I will tell you, the death of Rachel has to be one of the hardest moments of Jacob's entire life. He has had a love for Rachel that has passed life itself. And now, all he has left of Rachel are two boys, Joseph and Benjamin. So now that love for Rachel is totally centered around these two boys. In a short period of time, he's going to believe that one of those boys has died. That's Joseph. That leaves the only thing left of Rachel in his life is Benjamin, the son of his right hand, Benjamin. And now, through seven years of famine, the boy's got to get more food. And they say that the guy over there, Zephaniah, says, we got to take our youngest brother with us. And Jacob says, no. The only thing left that I have is Benjamin. He is my love of my life, the center of my life, and the only thing to remember me, to, to remember Rachel with. And finally, they say, Dad, we don't take Benjamin. We're all going to die. So Benjamin goes, and Jacob gives incredible instructions. You don't bring back Benjamin. I will not make it. So day in and day out, whether it's a couple weeks, whether it's a month period of time, before the boys come back to tell them the incredible news that not only does Benjamin come back, that Joseph is alive, he waits every day just to hear the news that Benjamin comes back. Now you think about that for a moment. For him to find out that Joseph is living. All right, so here we go. Verse 25. And they went up into, uh, uh, up out of Egypt and came into the land of Canaan unto Jacob their father. Verse 26. And told him, saying, Joseph is yet alive. Folks, there is only one thing that parallels this in the entire Bible, and we'll show you that in a minute. You probably can figure it out. And told him, saying, Joseph is yet alive. And he is governor over all the land. He's not only alive, he's governor over all the land of Egypt. And Jacob's heart fainted, for he believed them not. And then they told him all the words of Joseph, which he had said unto them. And when he saw the wagons, which Joseph had sent to carry him, the spirit of everyone together. What's the next word? Jacob. That was terrible. Let's try that again. The spirit of who? Jacob, their father. First time in the Bible it's mentioned. Here it is. And I think this is revival. When you get the right view of a risen Savior, my friend, you will never be the same. And it says, Jacob, when he says this, look at this. And the spirit of, everyone together, what's the word? Spirit of their father revived. And everyone together. What's the next word? Whoa. Whoa. Who's Israel? Jacob. Af Jacob is his fleshly name. Israel is his heavenly name. Named by God. When you get the right view of a risen Savior, you go from Jacob to Israel, friend. There will be revival in your heart. Notice the difference between the two names here. It was Jacob. It was Jacob. And now it's Israel. What made the difference? And, and students, I want to share this with you. There's a lot of things I do want to give you this week. And Lord willing, we'll have opportunities. Whether they're classes, whether they're, they're dorm, uh, residence hall, devotions, whatever it is. I have come here for three days to just give my heart to you. But I will tell you this. If you don't see, students, number one, that the reason why you're an ambassador is the Lord Jesus Christ and your relationship with him, everything I'm going to give you for the next few days doesn't really mean anything. You have got to never. And I really appreciated the choir's beginning song. You cannot lose the wonder of what Jesus Christ has done for you. You have got to keep Christ in focus with everything you're going to do for the rest of your ministry. And we're going to share a lot of things with you in the next couple days that you need to do as ministers of the Lord, as you go out to serve the Lord. But the one thing you have got 
to keep in picture is who Jesus Christ is in your life. And that will be a constant spirit of revival. You will not be a Jacob. You will be an Israel if you get the right view of Jesus Christ. Now look at this. This is so cool. Look at this. The spirit of Jacob, their father, revived. And Israel said, it is enough. I can't hear anything more. You have just told me. I can't handle it. You guys got to stop it. Don't tell me anything more. Because if you tell me anything more, I'm going to die. Look, it is enough. Joseph, my son, is yet alive. I will go and see him before I die. Father, I pray that this morning, this scene of what Jacob happened in his life would occur in our hearts. Father, may we see Jesus Christ lifted up on high. Father, I know of no greater picture of your son in the Old Testament, humanly, than Joseph. And Father, may we see Joseph as Jesus Christ in our life today. Father, I thank you for the pictures that we have in the Old Testament. And Lord, this picture of your son, I pray, would be put on the hearts of every student here. Encourage them, Lord with the Savior that they're about to go out to serve, that, Father, the rest of their lives and their ministry, they would realize is a relationship with this risen Savior, Jesus Christ. Father, we'll give you the praise and glory for what you're going to do today in chapel. And, Lord, by faith, what I believe is going to happen on this campus in the days ahead. And, Lord, we'll give you the praise and glory for it. In Jesus' name, God's people said, Amen. What a story, folks. This is a scene that's unmatched almost anything in the Old Testament. When every day Jacob comes out and he's looking, Oh, God of Abraham, God of my father Isaac, please, Benjamin, bring Benjamin back to me. It's all I have of Rachel. Please, please give safety to Benjamin. Only to find out that Joseph is alive. What a moment this had to be. Now, here's what I think. Now, as I'm reading this, and years ago I did a series on Joseph, and I came to this point, and I got to tell you, I'm up in my study, and I'm thinking this thing out, and I'm thinking, oh, this had to be unbelievable. First of all, we see the wagons, and they start coming. And I can imagine the servants of Jacob come running in the tent. Yaakov! Yaakov! They're coming back! They're coming back. Oh, Benjamin, please, Benjamin, please. And I think it's Reuben, the oldest, the one that got in all the trouble because Joseph died, you know. I think Reuben comes running in. He comes running in the tent, and he says, Abba, 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 is, is, is Benjamin, is Benjamin okay? Oh, Dad, oh, Dad, Benjamin is fine. Benjamin is fine. Benjamin is with us. But Dad, Joseph, Joseph, he's alive. Joseph is alive. Oh, what? Wait, what do you say to me? Uh, Benjamin, okay, yeah, Dad, Benjamin's with us. But Joseph is alive. No, 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 he, he's not alive. Here's the garment. It's all bloody. Here's his garment. Dad, we'll tell you about that later. But Dad, I'm telling you. Dad, I'm telling you. Joseph, he's alive. No, no. Joseph can't be alive. He, he's dead. I, I know he's dead. I, he can't be alive. Dad, Joseph is living. Now, I'm going to tell you. I know of no passage of Scripture that can revive a heart of a person more than what happens that in the Old Testament. And the only thing that rivals this is early morning on a Sunday morning. A woman walks into a garden. And she's got some spices because she's going to anoint a body of one that she loves so much. And has followed with all of her heart. Only to see that the tomb has been rolled away and the body is gone. They leave and... She comes back a little bit later. She begins to weep and cry. And she hears a voice from behind. And she thinks it's the gardener. 
And the only thing that rivals this moment right here in Jacob's life is when Mary clears her name. I think it's the greatest word in the entire Bible when Jesus says, Mary. And Mary turns around and realizes, you're not dead. You're alive. And I will tell you, students, wherever God leads you and wherever God guides you, the one thing that is different between Christianity and all other faiths is our Savior is alive. Man, you can go. You can go to the city of the dead and you can call the name of great men. Socrates! And a voice answers. Here. Buddha! Present. Muhammad! Here. But go call the name of Jesus of Nazareth. And an angel answers. He is not here. He is risen. Satan could not seduce him. Herod could not, death could not control him. And praise God, the grave could not contain him. Jesus Christ is alive. This past Sunday, I went over to a house after our church service. A house that had been dominated by Hinduism. They sent their little granddaughter to our school at Valley Christian Academy. We have an open enrollment. And they sent their little daughter for the education, not for the religion. And as a five-year-old little girl, Talison trusted Jesus Christ as her Savior. She'd go back and witness to her mom. And in her first grade year, we had the opportunity to see Talison's mother, Connie, come to know Jesus Christ as her Savior. Connie died of a very unusual disease about a week or so ago. And during the course of, of, of uh, Talison and then Connie getting saved, I had the privilege to lead Connie's mother the grandmother of the daughter, June to Christ. This is Japanese family. And Cato, their father, the grandfather, had not trusted the Lord yet. This past Sunday, I went over to a little memorial service. They invited me to come. My wife and I were really the only believers there. And when we went there, we saw, oh, everyone had such a hopelessness to them. Everyone just had such a hopelessness except for little Talison and June. Everyone, and my wife and I, everyone else, there's just, there's no hope. I want to tell you the difference between Christianity and all other faith folks is an empty tomb. If you go to a jeweler's one day, guy, guys, and you're going to get that nice ring, you know, that, 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 that big day is coming, you're going to go pick out that ring, and you go to that jeweler, he will probably bring out a black piece of velvet, and he'll lay that black piece of velvet out on the counter. And then he'll bring out a little box and he'll open that box and he'll sprinkle those beautiful diamonds out on that black velvet. And the reason why he puts the black velvet down is that those diamonds shine brighter and the crystal comes out better on a black backdrop. And I will tell you, there is no faith at the time of dark death that brings out our faith greater than at a gravesite. There is nothing like Christianity at a gravesite, friend, because Christianity is the only faith that gives you the hope and that because we have a risen Savior. Now, I was telling you about the strawberries. Those strawberries start coming in first week of February, and we get them for 10 and a half months. But the thing that's amazing is the strawberries that we get in February, the way they taste is just like the way they taste in October. And February are the first fruits. And Jesus Christ, the way he rose from the grave, is the first fruits. And the same way Jesus came out of the tomb is the same way one day we're going to be raised as well. And I want to tell you something, friend. When that moment came, when Jacob realized Joseph is living, what a moment that had to be. Don't you Never forget, students, you are serving a risen Savior. But it gets better than that. About that time, I think Simeon comes in. And Simeon comes walking and he says, Abba, Abba. 
Now, Simeon's the one that's been in the prison for a while in Egypt that they kind of held, you know. So I think Simeon comes walking in and he says, Abba, Abba, boy, it's good to see you too, Simeon. I kind of forgot about you. That's, that was looking about Benjamin. Yeah, Simeon, I haven't seen you for a while. Yeah. Dad, Dad, you won't believe it. I know. I know, Simeon. I heard he's living. Joseph is alive. I heard he's living. Oh, Dad. Not only is he living, but Dad, he's the Lord over everything. He's not only living, Dad. He's not living. We saw him as some slave over there. No, Dad. Our brother is the Lord of the whole thing over there. He's the governor. He's running the whole show. And I want to tell you something, students. Not only is Jesus Christ living, But Jesus Christ is Lord. And I want to tell you that's important because we're coming into an election year and we're looking and we say, oh, Lord, what's going to happen in America? And I will tell you what's going to happen in America. Only what our Lord allows. There isn't a place. Now, I know that if you're an ambassador at Baptist College, I know you believe in the free will of man. And I'm telling you something. You're looking at a preacher that believes in the responsibility of man and the free will of man. Man, do I believe that. But I also believe in the sovereignty of God. And I believe that God is Lord over all. Proverbs chapter 21 and verse 1. The king's heart is in the hand of the Lord. And he turneth it whether so as rivers of water. He turneth it whethersoever way he will. And I've always thought about that verse. And I looked that up one day. You know what the rivers of water are? It's like irrigation. It's like a sprinkling system. And then all of a sudden I understood the whole passage. The king's heart is in the hand of the Lord. And as a sprinkling system, the Lord allows it to go to wherever he wants to sprinkle on the area that he wants. You say, I'm not sure I understand what you mean. Here's what I mean. Those kings have free wills. They can shoot out whatever they want, but the Lord limits how much lawn they're going to cover. And it's like a sprinkler. You can irrigate this. This is as far as you're going to go, king. This is as far as you're going to go. And I want to tell you something. As we come into this election year and as you look at your own lives and you say, Lord, I know you're living, but are you in control? And he is students. He is in control of everything in your life. He is not only a living savior. He is the Lord over all things. And I can go to bed at night and know that the good shepherd is still in control of this world. And the good shepherd is still is in control of everything in your life. Maybe there's things going on back home. Maybe there's things going on in your family. Maybe there's things going on. And you say, Lord, what in the world's going on? And I just want you to know, not only is he living, but he is Lord. Well, what a moment this had to be. And about this time, I think Judah comes in. Now, Judah's the special one, because Judah's the one that when everything's starting to get revealed, he steps up because he knows he's the one to blame for Joseph being put in the pit and the selling and everything. So when Judah, when Judah gives one of the best confessions in the entire Bible, when Judah speaks to Zaphaphaniah, not knowing it, it's his brother, and just opens up his heart. And I think Judah comes in the tent, and I think there's tears rolling down his eyes. And he says, Dad, Dad. You won't believe it. Oh, I know, son. I know. <laughs> Joseph is living. Yeah, but dad, let me tell you what else. I know, son. I know. I heard. I heard. He's Lord over everything. Yeah, but dad, let me tell you. Not only is he living and not only is he Lord, but dad, he loves us. Dad, he loves us in spite of what we did. Dad, he's forgiven us and he loves us. And I want to tell you something. Not only is Jesus Christ living, not only is he Lord, but he loves us. And no matter what we've done, no matter where we've gone, that love is unconditional around us. And oh, what an incredible illustration of the love of God in Joseph forgiving his brethren and erasing the debt that his brothers owe him. He says, no, I still love you. Can you imagine when Judah walked in that tent that day? And he just tears streaming down his eyes. And he says, Dad, I'm the one who did it to your son. I'm the one. And Dad, not only is Joseph living, we thought he was dead. Not only, Dad, he is the Lord of all. But Dad, he loves us. In all that we did, he still loves us. And I think right about that time, I think Levi comes in. Now, I just picture Levi as this big, 
portly guy, you know? He just comes in and I just think, leave it. They say, why do you think that? Well, he's a preacher, so he's got to be big and fat, I guess. I don't know. But I, but Levi comes in and he says, Dad! Dad, you won't believe it. I know, Levi, I know. I, I, I know, Levi. He says, Dad, he's, I know, he's living. Yeah, Dad, not only is he living, I know, Levi, I know. He's the Lord over everything. Oh, man. He says, yeah, Dad, but besides, yeah, I know, I know, Levi. He loves us. Yeah, Dad, he does. But, Dad, let me tell you what else. Dad, He's longing for us to come back with Him. He's longing for us to go with Him. Dad, He's got a place. He's getting it all set up for us. Dad, we can get out of this old desert land. Dad, He's longing for us to be with Him. And I want you to know that night in the upper room, when those disciples were so confused, Jesus looked at them and said, Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my father's house were many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself that where I am, there ye may be also. Do you see Joseph is sent over to Egypt to prepare Goshen land for his brethren? And I want to tell you, we're here for a short time, and I know you're college students, and I know you think you got the rest of your, you know, you got, you're got you invincible and you're going to live forever. But I want to tell you something, students. Our time here is short. Jesus Christ is longing for us to go with him. You've got a short period of time to serve him. But do know this. There is a place called heaven that's being prepared for you. And we he is longing for us to be with him for all of eternity. Say, wow. This is a pretty dramatic moment. Oh, I think it was. For him to realize that my son is living. That my son is the Lord. That my son still loves me and my boys. That my son is long in for me. But then I think, Benjamin wants in. You say, well, Benjamin's the youngest, so he probably came in first, Brother Shetler. So I'm not too sure about your story on this. No, no, he comes in last. Because he's got so much stuff on. He's got more garments on. He's got more gold on. He's got more silver on than all the rest of the brothers. And I think, oh, Benjamin walks into the tent. And I just think, Jacob melts. And Benjamin walks in and says, oh, Dad. Oh, Dad. Oh, Benjamin. Oh, Benjamin. Dad. I got to tell you about my brother. I know, Benjamin, your brother, your brother is living. Yeah, but dad, more than that. I know, I know, Benjamin, your brother is the Lord. Yeah, but dad, more than that. I know, Benjamin, he loves us. Yeah, but dad, more than that. I know, Benjamin, he's longing for us. And I'm going to go see him with you. We're going to go see him. Yeah, but dad, more than that. I know he's living. I know he's the Lord. Man, I know he loves us, Dad. I know he's longing for us. But, Dad, he's loaded. I'm telling you, Dad, my brother's loaded. I'm telling you, Dad, my dad, my brother owns the cattle on the thousand hills. My dad, my brother is loaded. He is the richest guy in all the world. That's my brother. I want to tell you something, students. You are preparing to serve This living Lord who loves you and loves the world. He was longing for you to spend an eternity with him. But it's given you a chance to be on this earth. And I'm going to tell you something. Your Savior is loaded. He will give you all of your riches, all of your desires, all of what you desire in your heart for him. Oh, man, you read Ephesians chapter 1, and you will see that we are sitting with him in heavenly places Our Savior is loaded. Man, don't go out thinking, well, we're not we're not like the Muslim faith. We're not as big as the Muslim faith. Let me tell you, students, our leader is loaded. He's got all the power and all the riches. Man, I don't know about going to this foreign country. I'm not sure about going into evangelism. I'm not sure if I can handle this. You can. But I want to tell you a Savior who can. And students, as you serve the Lord, remember who you're serving. This week, 
I want to convict you. I pray that the Lord will allow me to challenge you in areas of your life, in your prayer life, in different areas of sanctification. But don't forget the whole thing here. The reason why you're here is because of who Jesus Christ is and what he did. I believe this is the most dramatic moment of the Old Testament. I think when Jacob realizes that his son and who he is is still alive, I think, and he says, it is enough. And he goes from Jacob to Israel. And my friend, your life will change when you get a picture of this Savior. And those days that you're down, and those days that you're discouraged, and those days, you know what, you need more than anything else, a care package from home. No. You need a promise from God's word of who Jesus Christ is. I just need a friend to talk to. You need the Holy Spirit to show you again who the Savior is that you decided to come to Bible college to serve. I will tell you, you will not be Jacob long when you get a picture of your Savior, Jesus Christ. You will be Israel.